do, frankly. Now we can turn our attention to a quick review of lecture one and two, and we'll just move through the slideshow relatively quickly just to anchor ourselves in what we've learned. Here is a list of what we have learned so far, sort of a study guide. We've defined mindfulness and what meditation and mindfulness do. We've looked at how neural networks grow and become like roads and highways in our brain and that we can transform and shape, shape those ourselves through self-directed neuroplasticity. We've looked at the autopilot thinking mode of the brain, which is called the default mode network, which picks up ideas and thoughts. And when you lie down and go to bed and you can't turn your head off, the default mode network is what is running. And meditation and mindfulness will chill the default mode network. They will relax it and calm it down and it starts talking less and less. So it creates space in your own mind, which is a beautiful thing. We have thoughts on purpose and we also have the salience network. So we have these three networks, there are more networks than this, but these are three major networks of thought, states of mind. Default mode is autopilot thinking. Thoughts on purpose is the executive, whether it's imagination or planning or playing. Um, and sometimes the default mode thinking has some really good ideas, right? So sometimes when I'm meditating, the default mode network will throw something out there that is a really good idea. It's like a co-pilot. I kind of see it as only it's not quite as able as you are. It's not as multi, it doesn't have as, as diverse and multiplicity of the intelligences. It doesn't have access to the salience network, for example. And it's definitely not you. It's one of the reasons, like your digestion is not you. It's part of you, but it's not you. So we can't think that the, we have, we want to tease out these default mode network thoughts. Sometimes when I'm meditating, I have helpful and useful thoughts. So one of the things that we'll do, um, a technique I use for that is to create a treasure box in my mind. And whenever I have a useful thought, I put it in the treasure box while I'm meditating. When I have a, a, a nothing thought, just one of those don't need to pay attention to it thoughts so that my mind wanders while I'm meditating, I imagine it floating away like a cloud or you can imagine it popping like a bubble. But those useful ones, we can put in the little treasure box in our mind and our mind really will remember them so that we can come back to them. We can learn to trust our mind. The more we can trust each other, the more we'll take care of each other. We learned about the negativity bias of the brain, which relates to today's talk, which is the evolution of suffering. Part of the evolution of suffering is the negativity bias that arose. We learned about the breath and relaxation response, about the sympathetic and parasympathetic arms of our nervous system that we seesaw between. We learned about the light of awareness and how our mind is like a house where we can direct our awareness to the different rooms of the house. We learned about that mind equals mind plus heart in Asian cultures. And it's a really good way to think about the mind as, as a holistic experience and the nine attitudes of mindfulness. So our mindfulness definition is being here now, dropping into the fully present moment out of the stream of thought, right? And coming back into being an all sensory being with kindness, with, an, with a kind heart. And cultivating that kind heart, you are able to conjure gratitude within yourself and feelings of love within yourself. We can continually do that until we sort of live in a state of gratitude and love as a resting state. That's absolutely possible. The more we practice it, the more we will grow. So we can think of mindfulness as kindfulness, as a kindfulness approach, which might help us drop into our heart a little bit more. We looked at how meditation includes lots of different kinds of exercises. And these different, like just like getting physically fit includes a multiplicity of exercises that work with the multidimensionality of our mind. And they all train us to go inward and work with this inner world. We're so used to putting all our energy outward that it can feel at first awkward to go inward, but we'll develop the more, just like when you start a class, at first getting to know the people around you feels awkward, but then you get comfortable with each other. And it's very much the same. We also talked about, I told the story earlier about how I was able to notice that I was feeling agitated inside and tend to that agitation rather than act out from it. 
that's the space, the space that meditation gives us and mindfulness practices give us. Even small amounts of meditation a day will increase that space, just like doing small amounts of exercise a day. And as we keep doing it, it tends to build on itself because we start getting a positive feedback on it, right? So we start to do it. It's ironic that observer mode enables us to be more connected with our experience, not less, being able to take a step back, kind of like when we're, when we're, when we're completely merged with the soup, we can't taste the soup. But if we have a little bit of space between ourselves and the soup, then we can really experience the soup. We learned about how our brain wires itself in neural networks like roads. We learned about how neurons form and that the more we actively participate with something, put our attention on it and get our body involved in it by writing and things like that. That's why writing out your notes is really helpful because it's activating more attention of your brain to help you learn things and groove in these neural networks. So does saying things out loud, practicing words out loud. If you have to memorize terms, a great method is to take a list with you Pick one term and the definition and say it out loud while you're on a walk and then define it while you're on a walk and do that repeatedly in your mind like five, 10, 15 times and your mind will learn that term and then go to the next term. So the more we engage actively with what we're trying to learn, the faster this, this highway of neural networks will grow. You can think of it a lot like those trees that you see. It's much like the branches of the trees that you see out in the woods, particularly the oak trees. We learned that the default mode network is that stream of thinking that happens automatically. And that enables us to function in the world, even though it's not a very high level of function, we're still at a survival level of functioning um, in the world without having to use even the executive network. We can operate on autopilot because of the default mode network, which has picked up knowledge from the past, projects it onto the future. Right, but it's not using these other networks, including our intentional system, right? Which gives us, this is our conscious self. So when a thought happens in your head, like that person's a jerk, and then you move to your intentional system and you think, well, is that really so? This is, this is higher reasoning. This is more, you can bring new energy to bear and fresher insights and broader insights and wiser insights to bear on the autopilot system which is doing the best it can, but it's just basically learning what it's hearing about. And sometimes it'll pick up ideas that aren't even yours, that you don't even agree with. It'll have picked up like you should be. A lot of the shoulds are not very self-examined, right? We haven't examined them much from our intentional system. We just are feeling like they, they we pick them up from society. So it's part of the autopilot system. And then when we examine it, we think, you know what? Maybe I don't need to be that way. Maybe I don't have to do it the way that, um, maybe I don't have to focus so much on being pretty. Maybe I don't have to, you know what I mean? So we can shift, maybe that's not as important. So we're distinguishing between these different kinds of thinking that we experience. We talked about how our mind puts as much as it can on autopilot so that we have as much bandwidth in our brain available to deal with an ever-changing environment right? So the autopilot itself is fast, intuitive. It doesn't really require any effort. So intentional thinking does require effort. And so it does, it does get tired, right? And so here are these three circuits of your mind. And next week, we're going to talk about toggling between the salience network and the central executive network. Um, this one is focused. And this one is like a zoomed out, right? It's open, expansive, and more creative, really, because this one is, is really tuned in and, and trying to um, accomplish things, get things done, focus in. So we'll be looking at zoom out, zoom in, really right brain, left brain next week. Um, we talked about how the default mode network thoughts are not you. They are conditioned thoughts that we have basically programmed, absorbed. And so really cognitive behavioral therapy is about examining these conditioned thoughts, including assumptions about ourselves that we picked up from others and they only have a limited view of us, right? So, 
and, and really examining them, examining the veracity or truthfulness of them, how, how accurate they really are. And oftentimes default mode network thoughts, like when you think of a worrisome thing or something, it's a piece of the piece of the story, but it does not reflect the whole story. So there's a bit of truth in there, but it's not a holistic truth. It's not a completely accurate truth. So cognitive behavioral therapy is about um, challenging default mode network thoughts and sometimes intentional thoughts if we've learned a lot of things that are uh, negative and inaccurate. So we'll be looking at that down the road. We spend a lot of time in this autopilot thinking, and it can tend to tilt a little bit towards worrisome rumination because of the negativity bias of the brain, which is survival based. And this is a core part of um, which means that our brain is organized to remember scary stuff most because it's the most threatening to our survival. So this is a big part of the evolution of suffering is this negativity bias of the brain that we want to work to offset and ease by easing our uh, physical and emotional systems. This is the negativity bias of the brain. Again, default mode network rumination. And the, what we're working to do in here, I'm gonna go back to these neural roads, default mode network rumination may have become a highway like this. So we've got to incrementally loosen its grip, right? And, and that's why it isn't easy at first. At first, when you quiet yourself, you notice all this busyness because you've been distracting yourself or we have, not you, we have been distracting ourselves from it in the past. So one of our goals is to help prune back the busyness of this default mode network system, ease its intensity and ease our over enmeshment with this system where we pay so much attention we put so much of the spotlight of our awareness on this system we want to ease that back so the mindfulness practices which you know the default mode network can actually get irritated with you for doing mindfulness because it likes having all that attention that's the idea of that it develops a little bit of a mind of its own the ego but it i think of it like a three-year-old child who's a little bit of a brat and wants to have its own way all the time and and you can incrementally help a three-year-old child um, become more regulated right? So they're not so selfish and not narcissistic and domineering. So at first, when we start to try to discipline a three-year-old child that's never been disciplined, the child's going to freak and act out worse. And I think that that's a little bit about what's going on when uh, we begin to work with our mind and it acts out more at first going, hey, wait a minute, I was center stage all the time before, but it's not really good for it to be center stage. It's not good for it or us for reasons we've already talked about. There's no pause there and it's, it's vulnerable to excessive rumination and it shuts down our access to these other dimensions of our mind. So we're not used to it. So it takes a little bit of time to untangle. So be patient with yourself on that. And we talked about how the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system and how deep breathing and especially a longer out breath and in breath and the pulses, the pulses help to activate the, the original response of our nervous system is actually parasympathetic. This is meant to be the primary state in which we rest, not sympathetic activation, which is highly associated. If you add a little bit of stress to it, it's, um, it turns into fight or flight. So then the energy all goes to our the outside parts of our body. And there are definite times throughout the day when we want to activate sympathetically, right? Where we want to have energy, we want to get into a highly active mode. Really what matters with this is whether it has a positive or negative emotional valence. Because parasympathetic with a negative emotional tone is frozen, being frozen. And sympathetic arousal with a negative emotional tone is being um, stressed out. Sympathetic arousal with a positive emotional tone is excited, inspired, motivated. Now, that's much better for your body, even though the energy is going to your arms and legs, as you can see here, 
and you're not doing rest and digest as much and immune support as much, we still want to be able to be energized. This is sympathetic arousal is designed to get us up and moving toward goals, toward long-term goals, um, like getting food and shelter and connection. Um, parasympathetic in the positive is feeling relaxed and groovy, right? Calm and easygoing. And then we looked at how our mind is like a house and where the awareness behind that can shine the light on the different rooms. And when we use our visualization, our imagination to imagine or reflect on someone that we love, we're inspiring and in gratitude and feeling gratitude. We're inspiring and in, in, um, creating within ourselves. We're self-creating those feelings of gratitude, love, and um connectedness so we're we're creating these neural structures we're literally building neural structures in our in ourselves by where we shine the light of awareness within us okay and we can rest in this field of awareness which is something that we'll learn we can sit back and and become one with that light behind <laughs> behind everything right? The light that can move and direct itself. And, and that's something that we become more familiar with the more we meditate. We talked about how mindfulness is heartfulness, and it can be helpful to think about mindfulness as kindfulness. And we talked about the nine attitudes of mindfulness, child's mind, non-judging, acceptance, letting go, trust, patience, non-striving, gratitude, and generosity. So we'll be exploring these nine attitudes of mindfulness over the next, uh, over the course of the semester. And one of your assignments this week was to choose one of these and reflect on which one you're most drawn to. So if you have a moment and you could throw it into the chat, could you share which one of these attitudes of mindfulness you're most inspired to practice this week? Which, which one of these, usually one of them will just pop out at us. And you could just write in the chat, which one of these you are most inspired. This is one of the quiz questions to receive points today. I, I am feeling drawn to acceptance. And with acceptance and letting go with both of those, when I, when I remember through the day, one of the practices I like to do is like when I breathe out, to just say, I accept, I'm releasing, I'm accepting, accepting and letting go. So sharing which of the nine practices of mindfulness. And uh, one really nice practice of letting go was, I love what you're saying about how trusting leads you to a child's mind. We talked a little bit about how we can practice letting go. I release and let go um, as we breathe our out breath. And that little micro, because our out, we're letting go of our breath, is like a micro practice, right? It's a little mini practice. Um, one of, one of the exercises that's helpful in letting go, and we'll talk about this more when we get to the week where we talk about this um, letting go, is, is to ask yourself, like you take something big that you need to let, or something that you need to let go of, like irritation over having to get a chore done. And you ask yourself, can I let go of my irritation of get, having to get this chore done? Can I let go of my irritation over being irritated about having to do this chore? You can break it into small pieces, right? Can I let go? What can I let go of right now relative to, you know, the tension I'm feeling in terms of this, this particular thing that I'm feeling that I'm clinging to? So you can try to let go in little small steps. And we talked about surfing our breath. I hope that some of you had a good experience with being able to join with your breath, to be able to connect with it and ride with it. Especially, I see a nod of the head, especially by approaching it gently, right? Not making it a forced thing, but, but gently sort of coaxing 
kindly, lovingly, the way you would a shy animal, coaxing your way to being connected to your breath. And then you might start to feel a sense of security breathing with your breath that way. Okay, very good, everybody. Thank you. Now we're going to go into the evolution of suffering, today's and growing calm, today's topic. So we have all of nature in us. You're the most complex being, humans, that are walking the planet and that we know of. And you have all of evolutionary history in you, all of it. So the ancestry of plant life, animal life, insect life, reptilian life, mammal life is all in you, everything. So when you look, you know, when we get irritated, I like to tell a story that when we get irritated because, uh, because somebody cut us off on the road, right? That's like a dog getting irritated because somebody took its bone. It's from a very sort of primal, natural, animal part of ourselves. But we were gifted with the higher faculties of being able to soothe and calm. Like my dog, she gets mad at somebody taking her bone. She's not going to teach herself how to stop being mad because some another dog took her bone. But I can teach myself that. That's that extra gifted ability that we have. So we have some automatic reactions that come from our biological and animal nature and that we can actually self-transform. That's why the phoenix, we can actually, that self-directed neuroplasticity, this ability we have to shift. And we have been shifting as a species over time. You'll see in a future lecture that we've been puppifying, we're becoming a gentler species. And as species become gentler, they, they look, there's actually um, a term for it, puppify. They become more um, softer looking. So wolves become softer looking into dogs, right? So we become sweeter looking, kinder looking as we as we puffify, which we are doing as a species. We'll take a look at that down the road. We are gentler than we were. Um, so we do have all our, our bodies share the systems of all the animals around us, right? Because it went through the evolutionary chain. And we'll see in a few minutes that we have that in the brain too. So it helps to understand how this machinery of our body runs so that we can take care of this soft animal of our body, as Mary Oliver says. We talked about the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems, which run through all animals. Um, the reptiles don't have a sympathetic system in the same way because this is meant for endurance searching, right? So a uh, lizard gets tired out really fast. Alligators don't run very far um, at all. And, but we can go for endurance. So the sympathetic is meant for us to be able to do longer pushes in the search for meeting our basic needs. And we talked about how the parasympathetic system is when you do your digestion and your immune function. So being in a relaxed emotional state is when you're going to be, even if you're energized, is when you're going to be um, yeah, your peak functioning, both in terms of your immune system and in terms of your brain, as we'll see in a few minutes. We also have all of evolution in our brain. You can see here with this, what's called the triune model of the brain, that that's breaking the brain into three sections. And we'll look at other models of the brain um, soon. Here's a, here's a picture or, or a, a kind of a a thing, what is this, a sculpture of the brain, and it's squishy, um, the way our brain is squishy, sort of like tofu, I think. And then what you have is, this is the cerebral cortex, the outer hemisphere of the brain, but within the brain are a bunch of structures, and we don't usually think about these structures within the brain that you can see here and you can see on the page. These structures here is the reptilian core. These structures are the same as reptiles have, alligators and lizards. These in the middle grew on top of this as we as creatures evolved. And so mammals have these structures in the middle. 
And these structures in the middle are where your primal emotions of mad, sad, glad, afraid, like dogs and, dogs and toddlers express, are very in the middle. This middle part is called the limbic system. You can see here on the slide, the limbic system. And limbic means ring, and it's our, our emotional feeling brain in here. And then it's covered with the cerebral cortex. This is called the cerebral cortex. <clears throat> cortex means outer layer. Cerebral means thought. So we have outer layer dedicated to thought and the prefrontal lobes right behind our forehead here, your eyes are here. The prefrontal lobes are the most highest developed part of the cerebral cortex. And this is where we have a much bigger cerebral cortex than pretty much any other species. The other ones who have large cerebral cortex, prefrontal lobes, this front part here and on the slide, you can see it right here. The other animals that have large prefrontal lobes are um, Dolphins, uh, elephants have larger ones than usual for their size, but ours are by far the largest. And this is that executive network here of your brain is the prefrontal lobes. Now, thought occurs here in this part of your brain, emotion in the middle. Thought and emotion communicate with each other. Um, this part of the brain is involved. The back is vision, and this part here is movement and feeling your senses. The front is your executive network. So other animals have this, the vision and the movement, but they don't have as big of a prefrontal lobe. So let's look at each of these. You can see here on this slide a little bit more about the triune brain. Got to plug in my laptop. And how it evolved. So you can see we have alligator in us mammals in us and and then this this uniquely sort of prefrontal lobe part of our brain also referred to as the neocortex so now let's look at these each quickly and we'll go back to this over time so that we become more familiar with it but we have first that reptilian cortex we have our little gecko there and we have this uh it's down here at the base it's the top of the spinal cord and this, this structure back here that they're still figuring out what it does in addition to movement and regulating automatic responses like heart rate and food. And it's a very primitive fight or flight system that reptiles have that it's located down here. Our dominant fight or flight is in the limbic system, but it's also connected to the fight or flight in the reptilian core. Right. So drives and instincts defending territory, alligators and lizards will defend territory. So our territorial instincts go all the way back to there. And it's funny if you think about it, um, when we used to be in the classroom, uh, students would come in and by the second class, they would have chosen their seat, the seat that they wanted to sit in. And if somebody else was in that seat by the second class, you would feel, some people would feel a mild sense of annoyance, a little surge of annoyance. Hey, that's my seat. That's that territorialism emerging from the reptilian core. Okay, so then we have the second level of the brain, which is the limbic system in the middle of the brain. And it's a bunch of very unique and distinct structures, as you can see here. Right, it's, it's a, a series of ring-like structures that enable us to feel these primal emotions of mad, sad, glad, fear, disgust, contempt, and love and bonding attachment, right? So we share these. Dogs are very, have uh, limbic systems that are very attuned to us. And you can notice that you can see what the expression on this dog's face and what he's feeling. There's a part of your brain called mirror neurons that can read that dog's face instantly because what that dog's feeling is stimulated by mirror neurons, a small amount of that in you. So you know it's a kind of mind reading. But this part of our brain doesn't have any thoughts in it. And as you know, children don't start talking until about one or two, and they don't have a lot of words until three or four. They don't have concepts till three or four, and they don't put together stories until three or four. So that's why you don't have memories of the earliest days, except for emotional and visceral ones, like sens sensory ones, like you smell something your mom cooked and it gives you a warm feeling. But you don't have thought memories. You don't have stories that you tell because that's in these prefrontal lobes. That's where thinking and thought and words comes from, right? So third 
another one of these limbic emotions. You can see how we share them with mammals and we even share the facial expressions of the limbic emotions. So these are all from this middle part of our brain here. These emotions are stimulated. And then we connect them with thoughts. So we would feel an impulse of love and then we think, oh, I don't want to feel that love for that person anymore because we broke up or whatever. So these engage back and forth, the thinking system and the emotional system. So the third level again is the prefrontal lobes. Now this rest part of our brain here, the curly gray matter, it's pink on this one, but the, there's a rest of this curly gray, gray matter. Here's the front. This is the prefrontal lobes behind the forehead. And the rest of this is devoted to senses, vision, and being able to move. So vision, and then the sensory motor cortex is there. So other animals have a cerebral cortex like this, but they don't have as large of a prefrontal lobe. And this is where your executive center of your brain, impulse control, restraint, on-purpose thinking, all thinking really, but including on-purpose thinking comes. And these are all neurally interconnected, the way you've wired up your computer to your speakers, to your you know, keyboard and all that. They're, they're internally connected through these neural networks. And so each of us has very unique neural networks. So that's the basic three parts of our brain and how you have evolution in your brain. So let's take a closer look at the limbic system and take a breath. Ah, and we, we're going to relax that limbic system. We're going to relax it. The limbic system with those primal emotions in the middle of the brain has this little organ called the amygdala. And you might try saying that out loud, amygdala. It's like almond. It actually means almond. And it's these are these two little red bulbs, the size of an almond, are the center of the fight or flight response. They're also the center of passion like feeling excitement and zeal and I love that and I'm having a blast. So they're, they're, they light up with passion. So when we detach from the amygdala, then we feel flat. We don't feel excitement or zeal of love of life. So we can't just get rid of the amygdala, but it's very involved in the fight or flight response. And it's actually different sizes in people. And when it's larger, people with bipolar and anxiety disorders, we see it larger. People with psychopathic traits who don't feel empathy or connection, it's shrunken and less fear, it's smaller. Okay, so the amygdala actually changes in size and it can be inflamed, like overutilized, and that would be overutilization of the stress response. So the amygdala is always scanning the environment for threat. That's why if something threatening happened, you would immediately respond because the amygdala has a, a super highway neuron that goes straight to your movement part of your brain to get you to move um, and act in case of an emergency, right? So the amygdala, and you can try saying that out loud, amygdala is part of the fight or flight response. So when the amygdala is activated and the stress hormones of adrenaline and cortisol go through our system, the energy, as we talked before, goes into our hands and feet so that we can run or fight or even freeze. But it goes away from the prefrontal lobes, away from the higher order thinking part of our brain. So we're not able to make a clear decision. We make impulsive decisions that are designed for survival that are based on the lower threat part of our body, you know, to, to, to survive, but we don't make higher order decisions. We're not able to do that whenever we're in a, in a fight or flight or a stressed out state. This is what happens in your brain when we are in a stressed out state. The blood flow leaves the cerebral cortex, the front of the brain and the higher executive center, it leaves. And so we become very impulsive, you can see here. We feel this sense of urgency when really we probably could relax and find a calmer way to get it done. We feel a sense of consuming, we're narrow-minded. We become very egocentric. It's about me and my survival. And we become, so we become less able to understand other people's points of view. So you can think about when you had an argument with somebody, let's take a breath. And you'll notice that you probably started to feel angry, very focused on your own needs, not able to focus very much on their point of view. 
oftentimes when people get in an argument with somebody, they want to resolve it right then, when in reality, it would be better to take a step back and get your whole brain back because the part that's shut off is the part of you that can understand other points of view, that can come up with creative solutions, that um, ha can come up with brand new ideas, the broader thinking part of you, and also with more impulse, <laughs> impulse control when we're in a calmer state. So let's take another breath. And as we breathe out, we'll just let go, let go, just let go of any micro tensions within you. So when we talk about a stressed out state, it's referred to as being in the red zone of the brain with, um, and the energy, you know, my, my husband likes to watch the MMA, mixed martial arts, and they got to use a lot of energy, you know, putting out a lot of energy. So they're, they're more in a amped up red zone state. And then the green zone state is relaxed, responsive, open, right? And we're able to have more strategic thought and things like that. So um, where are we in the red zone state or the green zone state is what one of the questions that we can ask ourselves as we move through life and try to cultivate a green zone state of brain. A lot of times we can get into a default position of being spending too much time in the red zone state, but we can actually train the green zone state of mind. So I mentioned our creative mind is all in the green zone state. When we are in the red zone, we contract. <clears throat> our thinking contracts because the energy is going away from the prefrontal lobes to the middle of the brain for action, fight or flight action, movement, intensity, immediate action. And so it can't put everything everywhere at the same time. So it pulls energy away from the higher order prefrontal lobes, which are more thoughtful and reflective and can see the bigger picture. That's why we need to cultivate a green zone brain to have a creative mind. We can be spend time in the red brain for a little while and sometimes we need to, you know, we have an urgent situation or something or we want to energize ourselves. And remember the what we're talking about with the red brain is is that we're dealing with upset emotions. We're dealing with some level of fight or flight, which is what stress is, is some level of fight or flight. <clears throat> And the green brain is when we feel more of a sense of security, security and calm. So the world outside can easily trigger us into fight or flight. And if we're living mostly from being triggered by the world outside without cultivating a green state inside independently of what's happening out there, then we're vulnerable to basically reacting to whatever is going on in our environment. So the idea is to cultivate and train a baseline of inner calm, inner well-being, let's take a breath, a calm footing, so that we can, from that place, approach what we experience in the world outside. So here's one more direction we're going to go now, and that is that life continually presents challenges to us all the time. So the external stimuli can automatically stimulate red brain. And if we don't do anything on purpose to soothe and calm that, then because of the negativity bias, we can pretty quickly and easily move to living in a fairly chronic red brain state, right, of some level of anxiety and uncertainty. So what we want to cultivate is security related to these three core needs. And these would be good to write down. And in fact, let's write them in the chat as a method of quiz question. What are your three core needs? <laughs> they are safety, satisfaction, and connection. And what we want to do is cultivate a feeling inside that we are able to meet these core needs. So good job, you guys, writing down safety, satisfaction, and connection. Those are the three core needs of human beings and mammals, but we have the ability to self-cultivate them within ourselves, right? Regardless of what's going on in the external environment. So we're gonna be looking at some methods of how. 
So this little creature right now is feeling it looks like safety, satisfaction, and connection. Little tiny mammal. All right, when our needs are challenged, which they often are in a continually changing world, we can respond for, from a frazzled place or from a centered calm place. And um, it's not like we can do this. I mean, we can get better and better. Remember growth mindset. So we can get better and better. We start from where we are and we soothe and calm and help ourselves get better and better to move into the place of calm footing. Many of us have never thought about the idea that this is something we can cultivate in ourselves regardless of what's going on in the out external environment. So let's look at some examples of how this might look. And I know that you'll see this in your own daily life. In the green zone, we have, if, if we're dealing with experiencing challenges, to safety, we can approach it when we're feeling green from determined, calm, capable coping, dealing with the threat without being overwhelmed. But if we're in the red zone and our safety feels threatened in some way, say we have to move, say we're just feeling agitated because of feeling pressure like I was last night, we can get overwhelmed with fear and frozenness or withdraw or go on the attack, right? So I was vulnerable to snapping at my husband over what he said because of interpreting what he was saying in more negative a way than he meant it because of the red zone state I was in, put a little red zone tint on what he shared, right? So relative to the need of satisfaction, we can respond to challenges by making plans. And this is what you do naturally when you calm down from being in a red zone state and you shift to the green zone. This is when we take care of the business at hand, right? So what we're learning is how to shift more quickly, how to distinguish between red zone and green zone states that we're in and how to help ourselves shift over to a green zone state. So we can make good plans to solve the problems that we have use our creative resources, and hold on to a core sense of gratitude as we work to meet needs, right? Because gratitude has been proven to be one of the most powerful practices that we could do to help us feel good about, feel good, period, to shift our attention from feeling a sense of, I don't have that, to look what I do have and my gratitude for what, what I do have. And that ironically tends to bring what we want to us faster. Whereas if we feel a threat or a challenge to <clears throat> satisfaction and our brain is in the red drum, we can get caught in this to be drivenness toward goals, being overwhelmed with a depressed mood or what the Buddha is called clinging, right? Clinging, which is, which is what addiction is, right? Holding on to something, insisting that you have this one thing. And then when we feel threats to connection, we can hold on to our self-worth and a sense of I, thou with others, which means seeing the person as a live human being and not a it, I, thou versus I, it, um, which is dehumanizing the other, right? So feeling a sense of I, thou, reaching out and extending love, whereas another approach is getting caught up in feelings of shame, inadequacy, or low self-worth or dehumanization of the other. So now we're in a contracted, notice how contracted the red zone <clears throat> states are and how expanded the green zone states are, which relates to what we're talking about next week, which is focused and expanded. All right, but again, emotional valence, the emotional tone, whether it's positive or negative. So we can build a core of resilient well being inside. So we feel in the core of our being already peaceful, contented, and loving as we manage challenges to safety, satisfaction, and connection. And here's a quote from the Dalai Lama that talks about how our calm mind brings us inner strength and, and self confidence. So let's take a breath. And we relax and let go and relax and let go and relax and let go and feel our heart. So there's the idea of being in a certain state of mind and turning that into a enduring trait. So believe it or not, we can turn smaller states of being in the green zone into a steady trait where that's where we are most of the time. And you can think about what you feel most of the time, you know, how agitated or calm or relaxed do you feel? And where's that needle 
right? And we can move that needle with the growth mindset to feeling more and more and more calm, more and more. And, and by calm, we don't mean passive. You can feel calm, joy, and energized. You can feel energized, calm, right? Which is what athletes need to cultivate within themselves is, is to be filled with energy, but also have an inner stillness within so that because that's moving them into the salience network, which enables them to react, gives us them the broadest range of possible reactions that they can choose from. Marcus Aurelius was a great warrior who um, is one of the inspirations behind the philosophy of stoicism that we'll be looking at, which is cultivating inner strength. And this is one of his quotes. So here's, we're gonna close with four tips for building a growing sense of calm. Training resting state relaxation builds neurons in our brain that calm us down from stress. And I'm gonna ask you guys to write down which one of these you're most drawn to practice. Although um, I'm gonna encourage everybody to practice all four. So as part of your quiz, it'll be which of these are you most drawn to practice? And um, I need to let you know that I have to close our meeting. I mean, we will finish, I'm sure by 1220 today, but I have to close by 1225 because I have another meeting I have to attend at 1230. So my apologies for having not having that time to stay a little bit longer after like I like to. Okay, so here's four of our practices. And this is this one minute relaxation every day is a wonderful practice. And this is a different breath exercise. So we'll try it a couple of times. <clears throat> and this is shifting out of anxiety and inducing relaxation. So what we do is we use the breath for this and we're gonna to inhale to three and exhale to six. And we're gonna do that three times. And extending the out breath activates, as you know, the parasympathetic system. And this is a little bit different from the sort of box breathing that we were doing before of inhale to four and exhale to four. Now we're inhaling to three and exhaling to six. So we're really extending that exhale. And you might imagine fluffy white clouds in the sky or the ocean, whatever peaceful scene, um, relaxing certain pressure points in the body, I'll guide you through us and feeling a sense of connection of love, which is basically a part of all the brief relaxation exercises we do. So let's take a breath in, two, three, and now we're gonna exhale to six, two, three, four, five, six, and imagine, vast spaciousness in your mind, breathing in, two, three, and now we're gonna exhale, let go to six, relaxing the space between our eyes, relaxing our shoulders, relaxing our jaw, and relaxing our diaphragm. And in, two, three, and releasing, two, three, four, five, six. Let's do one more, breathing in, two, three, and release, two, three, four, Imagining that spaciousness in your mind, five, six. Good, and it's nice to just put your hand on your heart and remind yourself of your intention for the day. I wish myself to be mirthful, playful, light, right? So one minute a day to do the calming breath and then the closing intention with your hand on your heart of how you wish to move through the day. And again, this is all training, like you're at the gym. Okay, a second one is, this one's extremely powerful. I'll be right back, I need to shut the door. Okay, this one is very powerful for um, inspiring a sense of security, surprisingly. And it's a very simple exercise. And it's one that you can follow the relaxing breath with. 
And that is the calming breath with the longer exit, the one minute breath. So it's knowing where you are and what's okay about it. And this is an exercise used really often with trauma victims because it helps reground and create a sense of safety. So what we're doing here is cultivating a sense of inner safety. So let me walk you through it. Okay, so we, we would take a breath. Let's say we're closing our breath our one minute breath and we release and we notice where we are. We really feel where we are. I'm in the room, I'm sitting in the chair, I'm safe right here, right now. I can feel the air around me, I can hear the cars outside and I can feel where I am. I can feel the solidness of my body here in this room. And I notice that I am safe and secure here right now. We continue to breathe, maybe even surfing and merging with our breath and noticing, noticing that we can tell where our body is. We can feel, it's called proprioception. We know where our body is. It's a special sense that you don't think about because you think about touch, feeling, hearing, but we have this inner sense of knowing where we are in space. So we tune into that ability. It's very grounding, very healing, very calming of trauma, breathing in. And we just say to ourselves, here I am. I know where I am. I'm safe. I'm grounded. I'm solid right here, right now. Very good. And then we can open our eyes. Excellent. So it's a simple exercise, just takes maybe 30 seconds, 20 seconds, you can add it to the one minute relaxation breath. And it's very grounding and centering. I don't know if, if you noticed or felt you might mention in the chat, if that led you to feeling a sense of being at home in your body, safe and grounded within yourself. Okay, then we have ground and connection. So you can see the little mice here hugging his teddy bear. We all have teddy bears around us, pictures of loved ones, things that remind us to feel good. The picture behind me is something my son painted when he was a child. And we can stimulate our need. We can help us feel the security that we're part of a tribe, part of a group that cares about and that we care about them by tuning into and resting our eyes upon and in a sense, mentally hugging those sources of connection that we have, um, like the picture behind me that my son painted. You'll notice them all around you now. And as you light your eyes upon them, allow yourself to feel a sense of gratitude and for these to become touchstones for you, for reminding you that you are part of a caring group that both cares about you and, and that you care about. Connecting that feeling of being part of a tribe, really anchoring, wiring that in. I am very much part of a tribe, of an ever-growing tribe, including the tribe of this class that cares about you. So tune into the teddy bears in your environment that give you a sense of connection. Really important for us as mammals because we grew up in our ancestors evolved in scary situations where the tribe was the source of survival. So it's very much wired into us. And with social media, we have an unusual thing in ancient cultures, in early tribal cultures, the tribe always knew everybody that they hung around with all day, every day. So there's a certain security in that. Whereas in modern culture, we meet and come across a lot of different strangers and social media exacerbates that. So <clears throat> because of that, it's really important. We can get a sense of feeling alienated and lost. So it's really important to tune in and remind our mammal mind that we are part of a very loving, valuable tribe and we can always expand the tribe. We can always build and grow our tribe. And then the inner moxie. Now, this is a great tip from Rick Hansen, and that is that part of yourself. It's very helpful to tune into the part of yourself that's on your side, that will, that will fight for your survival, that is there for you, that is wildish and powerful, 
right? So tuning into that inner feisty being inside of you that will fight for you and a sense of grit, a sense of power, inner power and inner inner sort of self-love, self-trust, and just kind of connecting with that. And it might even be fun to come up with a symbol of your inner moxie. In fact, I want to encourage everybody who's here today and may come next week, and I'll write this as a reminder to bring a symbol, something that symbolizes your inner feisty wildness, that part of you that is on your side, that cares about you and will be here for you. The part of you that that you draw on when you go through extreme challenges and you face them and you've transcended them and that inner side of you can um they surfaced and helped you get through that and you met that very very powerful and special part of you your inner moxie so now i'm going to ask you to notice which of these you'd like to focus on this week one minute relaxation every day and and share it in the chat as part of our quiz question and this is the longer out breath, feeling the spaciousness of the sky, relaxing your body, if you can remember to at the same time and closing with love. And then know where you are and what is okay with about it. A great exercise to follow the breath, but it can be done at any time that you're feeling uncertainty and insecurity. You just ground yourself. Where am I right now? And really feeling it, using the sense of proprioception of that, that ability to know exactly where you are when you close your eyes, you still know where you are because of that sense. You can feel your body in space. The third one is your, your personal teddy bears of connection that remind you that you're part of a tribe and an important member of the tribe, both for receiving love and giving love, helping to strengthen others, and then your inner moxie. Okay, which of these four? Oh, good, grounded and good one. The grounding and connection is absolutely wonderful. And this will be the meditation that will be the meditation um, number two option for this week. And it Rick will walk you through a very similar meditation than the one that we did at the beginning of class. I'll also be posting uh, a similar feeling safe meditation where I will walk you through all of these four, the one minute relaxation followed by knowing where you are, followed by feeling a sense of connection and followed by connecting with our inner moxie. So I'll post that by tomorrow. So there'll be two meditations this week as usual. And then the mindfulness practice will be to pick one of these four to, to practice one of these four tips to practice every day. And then we'll be sharing about that in the discussion. The reading this week is very short. It's a one page article that sort of tunes us in and reinforces these same kinds of ideas. And if you, oh, way to go. I agree, focusing on all of them. The guided meditation that I post will, will walk you through all of them strung together for about a 10 minute meditation. And Rick does too at this meditation here feeling safe. Okay, so this is one part, because as we go through the course, we'll work with our mind. Right now, we're focusing on working with our body and helping our body feel that sense of calm, nurturance. I really appreciate you all coming today. Um, I like this quote about how creating that inner sense of calm inside enables us to meet the challenges of our lives with more equanimity and inner power and choice, a wider realm of choosing. And I wish you all a really wonderful week. If you would share what your favorite in the chat, the closing quiz question, what your favorite topic was today, and anything that you would, a closing comment or well wishes for your colleagues here. Cultivating a sense of community amongst us. Next week, I hope there to be more time for us to have a little bit of chat toward the end. And I apologize for having to uh, leave a little earlier than usual this time. But I thank you all for being here today. I wish you a sense of calm. I wish for you to feel safe. I wish for you to feel connected. And I wish for you to feel satisfied. Gratitude is another way of thinking about satisfied, grateful, 
for what's in your life. See, what were some of the favorite topics? The green and red zone brain. Excellent. I agree with you completely. It really helps. And I start to notice when I'm in the red zone brain, I think to myself, how can I shift to green? I ask myself the question, what do I need right now to shift to green? What do I need right now to shift to green? Really beautiful self-reflected question. Learning about the three-part brain and that you have all of evolution in you. We'll be talking about that more and more because as I mentioned, sometimes our skirmishes, oftentimes our skirmishes are simply that wild animal that we're not afraid of arguing over the bone. And if we can step back and see that, we can activate our higher consciousness abilities and have a greater realm of choice about how to deal with arguing over a bone. And then the three core needs, excellent. The three core needs we have, safety, connection, and satisfaction, right? And we can help feel satisfied by cultivating and the almonds in your brain. Good one. I love that. The amygdala, the fight or flight response. We can soothe and calm the amygdala. All of these practices train amygdala to be in a resting state of calm instead of a resting state of agitation. So we can shift it. I love how you pick different things. I get a real kick out of that. I think that's really neat. It shows the beauty of our diversity and how we can see. Thank you all so much for today. I wish you a wonderful week and I look forward to seeing you next week. Franklin, I'll see you tomorrow. All right. Thanks everybody.